Good evening and welcome to UCL for the launch of our new fundraising and engagement campaign. It's wonderful to see so many friends and supporters of UCL here in this audience and also so many new faces too. Welcome. We have a fascinating evening ahead. Some of UCL's most influential and exciting thinkers are going to be sharing with us their views on the future on the biggest issues society will face for the next 100 years. Health, human rights, equality, the future of our very planet, and how their research is shaping these debates. I cannot wait to learn from them. As a graduate of UCL myself, and now an honorary professor here, I'm so proud of just how world-class our research is. We're consistently ranked amongst the top 10 universities in the world. We have 29 Nobel laureates who have worked here, who have studied here. But more even than those accolades, I'm extremely proud of our history of radical thinking. I don't know if all of you know, but we are the first English university to admit students regardless of religion. We're the first university, first English university, to admit women students on equal terms to men. And I'm proud of how this spirit of radicalism is manifest today in the explicit mandate we have as staff or students have to think radically, to think disruptively. And as you'll hear, disruptive thinking is one of the key elements, one of the key pillars of the campaign we're launching. A campaign that, yes, needs funding. We all know that funding is vitally important for the kind of game-changing research we want to undertake here. But a campaign that you can contribute to in other ways too. Your time, your skills, your expertise, the mentoring you can offer our students, the help you can provide are every bit as important, every bit as transformative. And as you'll see, we'll be seeking your contribution in these important ways too. We have a packed evening ahead of education, inspiration, and enlightenment. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to UCL's President and Provost, Professor Michael Arthur, to give a short overview of the campaign. Uh, thank you very much, Norina, and welcome to all of you to the launch of this uh, major new campaign uh, for UCL. Uh, I'm extremely proud to be part of a university that has done uh, so much good for the world and is filled uh, with ambition to do so much more. To get us started, we're going to show you a short video, and this will give you a flavour of what this new campaign will achieve. UCL, I think right from the beginning, when it was conceived, was about thinking out of the box. It's all academic. The next hundred years is a challenging time. Climate change, migration, global health. We have to do something to address these challenges. If you look at the supply and demand of funding, there really is an imbalance. It's very difficult for the big funding agencies to fund it. And that is where philanthropy steps in. Philanthropy is absolutely key for UCL because it allows us to do new things. The group has been working on ovarian cancer screening for the last 30 years. We're trying to tackle the most complex problem we're facing at the moment, which is dementia. We're interested in doing things that make a real difference. Philanthropy has helped me personally as a scholarship student and without that scholarship I wouldn't have been able to come to UCL. Every student who leaves UCL will have had some chance to have done some volunteer work but also will understand the importance that they can make in society. UCL is engaged now with developing our new campus in Stratford, UCL East. East isn't just a geographic location. It stands for Experimental Arts Society and Technology, and that's what we're going to be doing there to transform that part of London. 
Disruptive thinking is starting from somewhere else, looking at problems in a new way. It may be about people, it may be about new buildings, or it may be about pieces of research, but it's always about doing that extra thing that makes a huge difference. Please support the campaign. Please support the campaign. Please support the campaign. Support the campaign. For UCL. For UCL. For UCL. It's all academic. I have to say, I couldn't quite resist that cheeky little smile at the end, but uh, if, I, if I could sum up the ambition uh, of this campaign in one sentence, it would be, uh, quite simply, to make a real difference. Uh, in fact, that sentence could serve as UCL's unofficial motto from its founding day right through uh, to today. UCL was set up by people who wanted to change the world by doing things differently. Right from the start, philanthropy was a major part uh, of making that happen. Uh, nearly 200 years later, it's still the magic ingredient that gives our brilliant staff and students the freedom to try new things and to think differently. Today, uh, our ambitions are bigger than ever. We will develop effective treatments for dementia within 10 years. We will improve the precision and therefore the effectiveness of cancer medicines. We will help to regenerate East London and ensure that local communities reap the benefit. We will provide the best opportunities and experience for talented young people, regardless of their background. Many campaigns define philanthropy as donating money. Uh, but there are many different ways to make a difference, and money, whilst important, is just one of them. Uh, our generous partners and supporters give us much more than money. They also share their knowledge, their influence, and their passion. Uh, our alumni share their expertise and experience with each other and with our current students through volunteering, mentoring, and networking activities, creating a powerful worldwide network uh, and support system. Our staff and students create a vibrant community that attracts the brightest uh, and the best because, it's, because it is so much more than simply a place where people come to work. Uh, I am proud that UCL is a global community with a global vision making a global impact. Since 2011, we have now raised over £253 million from generous uh, donors from 76 different countries uh, from around the world. Uh, our alumni community of more than 200,000 people can be found in 191 countries. And students uh, today, the student body today, uh, over 150 countries are represented in those that study uh, at UCL. Uh, over 30% of our staff uh, originate uh, from outside the UK. They come here to work, study, and partner with us because they know it's a place uh, where they can make a difference to their own lives uh, and to others. The great challenges of health, well-being, sustainability, and equality do not have borders. Neither should the work nor the research uh, to develop the solutions. A major part of UCL's success is that we attract and retain the most talented, creative, and go-getting people from around the world to work and study here. Universities are the great beacons of genuine internationalism. Now more than ever, it's vital that UCL keeps that flame uh, burning strongly. So I would like to thank you for joining us today to show your support for UCL. Uh, and to be part of our community. We've had some 1,600 people uh, register for this event. There's another room just as packed as this around the corner. We are so pleased with your response and so grateful to you uh, for doing that. People will live longer, better lives. They will fulfill their potential and achieve their ambitions because of what we uh, will all do uh, together. So this campaign is central to everything that UCL will be in the future. 
and I'd like to finish by thanking you for being part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Arthur. This is clearly such an exciting and also important time for UCL, a time in which we all can make a substantial difference to our lives and to the lives of future generations. And I'm very proud to be a campaign champion, and I hope that many of you in this room will join me in becoming UCL campaign champions too. But now to the intellectual meat of the evening. The theme of tonight's event is, how will society survive to the 22nd century? A big and overarching question, essentially asking what the future holds for our wealth, health, for our planet, for how and where we will live. And we have five prominent UCL thinkers who will be each speaking for five minutes giving their personal answer to the question and also sharing insights from their own research. After our panelists have spoken, um, I will be opening up the debate to you, the audience, for questions. So start, please, thinking of them. We'll also be keeping the debate alive on Twitter. So those of you who do tweet, um, put your phones back on if they're off, but your ringers off, please. And we have a campaign... Um, Hashtag UCL campaign, so please use that. And now to introduce my brilliant panelists. May I please welcome to the stage Kevin Fong of UCL Center for Space Medicine, an expert in medicine in extreme environments. Lucy Green of UCL's Department of Space and Climate Physics, whose work also includes presenting The Sky at Night. John Hardy of UCL's Institute of Neurology, who this year became the first UK winner of the prestigious Breakthrough Prize for his research in dementia. Into dementia. <laughs> Henrietta Moore, Director of UCL's Institute of Global Prosperity and internationally renowned anthropologist. Henrietta. And finally, Philippe Sands of UCL's Faculty of Laws, a leading authority on international human rights, best-selling author and documentary filmmaker. Uh, before our prestigious panelists start, though, I want to get a sense of what you, our audience, thinks are the biggest issues that society will face into the future. If you reach into your bags, you will see that you have a pink paddle inside it. Like this. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you to choose between three big challenges ahead of us that we're facing. Human rights and equality, the sustainability of planet Earth, and the aging population. I'm going to ask you to choose which of these challenges you think is the biggest challenge that we will face over this coming century. So, who thinks human rights and equality is the biggest challenge facing us? Please raise your paddles. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, who thinks the sustainability of Earth is the biggest challenge? Oh. <laughs> wow. Okay, thank you. And how about the aging population? Who thinks... <laughs> okay, this may reflect your relative youth as I look, as I look into the audience, but aging, aging less so. Okay, is that, is that the reason? Okay, well, it'll be very interesting to see whether our initial opinions change um, after our experts speak, because we will be coming back to this question later on. But now it's time to start our discussion. First up is... Kevin Fong, who will kick off with his answer to the question, how will society survive to the 22nd century? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very honoured to be here today. I started out life 
at UCL 19, a very underprepared uh, student. I applied to study astrophysics because the University College Applications Handbook is alphabetically arranged. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I didn't think I was bright enough to be a medical student. I always wanted to be a doctor. And then my second year, I lived with some medical students. And one night, I came home. I looked at them really hard and thought, how hard can it possibly be? <laughs> uh, I, I did medicine also at UCL. UCL was very good to me. Uh, and after that, because I had those two degrees, I was lucky enough to work for um, National Aeronautics and Space Administration Medical Operations Group. We worked out how to send people to Mars, and then I came back to Earth, and now I work here as an anaesthetist and an intensivist. Um, I'm all about exploration, actually. I think the 22nd century is only accessible through the best exploration. And we've just lived through probably the fastest century in the history of centuries, uh, and let me take you through it. Uh, we start uh, at the start of the 20th century, where there's still white space on the maps of the Earth, places where no human foot has ever trodden, uh, and yet, Scott and Amundsen take on the Antarctic in 1912. We take on our highest mountain peaks by 1953. We go outwards and onwards and across the sky into the endless skies and out into space by 1961. In 69, Caesars land on the moon. That same physical exploration enabled by science and technology uh, also saw us explore inwards to ourselves uh, and to the corners of the human being and the human body. Uh, and, and when we talk about medicine, we have this uh, tendency to talk about progress in medicine through what my, my friend, who's, uh, Richard Barnett, who's a medical historian, likes to call the Blue Peter timeline of progress, where one good thing happens after another and another, and it all went on to make things better. It is true we've made progress, but it hasn't been straightforward. And a lot of the medicine that we have today uh, that, that prolongs life and makes life today safer and longer lived than it ever has been before uh, comes from some fairly dark places. Cardiac surgery at the start of the 20th century had never really been attempted with any hope that anyone would survive it. Uh, it comes to fruition really after World War II in the wake of uh, first the D-Day Normandy landings and then the Battle of the Bulge when surgeons are finally forced to try and confront this problem of metal fragments in people's hearts and Dwight Harkin makes that a reality and after his uh, exploration of the wounds of soldiers, the continent of the heart is opened uh, to medicine in the same way that the continent of Antarctica was opened to Amundsen, by Amundsen and Scott in 1912. Plastic surgery comes from the injuries sustained largely. Uh, the modern plastic surgery comes from the injuries sustained first by uh, soldiers in World War I and then in World War II airmen flying vehicles that were needed to, to defend the country but led to uh, appalling wounds. Uh, and my own speciality of intensive care comes from a fight against disease, uh, the epidemic of um, uh, polio that swept through northern Europe in the 1950s. So this, this exploration is one that is mitigation against the consequences of earlier invented solutions uh, and, and is required for us to make progress. Um, by 1973, of course, we have the first uh, node of the internet outside of the United States and CERN here at UCL, and after that, it's explosive. In 1975, uh, we have the Russians and the Americans collaborating in space. I was five years old. It's the first thing I remember, uh, 45 to save you the arithmetic. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and so that leaves us here. Uh, at the end of this time. Now, if you're looking for how we get to the 22nd century, I'll tell you that the future is unknown. Niels Bohr, a very famous physicist, said predictions are very difficult, especially those about the future. Uh, and so, for my book, the only way to the future is to accept its uncertainty and to be the best explorers that we can be. In 1912, the ship of exploration that took Amundsen and Scott to the Antarctic, took them to the Antarctic, would be totally recognizable to Ferdinand Magellan, who'd sailed around the globe five centuries earlier in 1518. Um, by 1969, the state of the art in ships of exploration was the Saturn V rocket going at 25,000 miles an hour to the moon. Unrecognizable. Uh, I'd put it to you that the answer to the question, how do we get to the 22nd century, is to build the best ship of exploration for the state of the art of the world today. And that looks very much like a multi-faculty university that's able to take the knowledge and temper it and move it forwards into the future 
mitigating the consequences of the knowledge it finds and making the best of it as it goes along. Thank you very much. Do you mind going? Um, John, it yes, on? it's you. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, you, I think you've set this up really well, and now we turn to you. Hi. So we've heard a little bit just now about how medical progress has happened over the last century, just to, as an aside in the last speaker. Of course, with that medical progress has come increasing life expectancy. Life expectancy has gone up from 40s to 80s now. And this is really, this has been a fantastic and phenomenal achievement of the last century. But of course, now it's setting up a problem for us. It's still the case that 20% of us, 20% of us who get to the age of 80 plus will start to suffer from dementia. And clearly, especially with declining birth rates, this is putting an enormous burden on society. How are we going to mitigate this burden to society? How are we going to avoid the scourge of dementia in our elderly, which is, you know, threatens to bankrupt our country, of course is, is terribly debilitating, for pe of course, for the individuals, but for, the, for their families. How can we stop this scourge uh, affecting our society and societies across the globe? Because increasingly, this is becoming also a problem in developing countries as well as in developed countries. How are we going to do that? Well, the way we're going to do it is by understanding this process, understanding what causes dementia. And then once, you're under, once you've understood what causes dementia, starting to intervene in that process, intervene in the process of, of cell death and uh, onward dementia. How can we do that? Well, here at UCL, I think we are the world leading center for that. And we, we are the world leading center for a simple reason to do with the structure of the NHS. If you have early onset dementia, the place to come is, the, is Queen Square, the Institute of Neurology and the National Hospital. And the, re, the result of that clinical excellence that we have at the National Hospital and at the Institute of Neurology is that every unusual dementia really comes to the attention of my clinical colleagues. I'm a PhD. You can tell I'm not an MD by my clothes. Um, <laughs> But those, we have the best clinical colleagues we could possibly have here. And the result of that is that virtually every genetic risk factor for every dementing disease has been discovered in part by people working at Queen Square. And therefore, we understand the processes underlying the many dementias, not just Alzheimer's disease, but also Parkinson's disease, motor neuron disease, frontotemporal dementia. Most of the genes that for all of these syndromes have been discovered uh, through the clinics of, of Queen Square and the scientists at the Institute of Neurology. So now we understand the genes. We're starting to understand their functions. We have a good view of many of their functions. And we're starting to understand the processes which cause the disease. In Alzheimer's disease, we believe that the cause of the disease is the buildup of amyloid proteins. These amyloid proteins, the families with these amyloid proteins came to Queen Square. Indeed, they still come to Queen Square. And now, in the, in the final stages of clinical trials, are anti-amyloid drugs, which we hope will start to uh, alleviate, the alleviate the symptoms of disease. So we have gone close to the whole pathway now of understanding the disease uh, to starting to develop effective treatments. With support, I'm sure that we can go much further. I'm sure that just uh, these amyloid-based treatments will not be the whole story, and indeed they are only relevant for Alzheimer's disease. But with support, I am sure we can make similar progress in Parkinson's disease, motor neuron disease, and frontotemporal dementia. 
So with your support, I am sure that over the next 10 or 15 years, we'll start to develop effective treatments which will slow the dementia processes so that our, the next generation can live at least in part without the scourge of these dementing illnesses. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, John, for these inspiring and encouraging, actually, words. Henrietta, it's now your turn. Thank you. Right, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much again for coming. Uh, my proposition for the evening is that we need to redefine what we mean by prosperity. Prosperity is not just wealth. It's a combination of wealth and well-being, certainly. But it's also about feeling that one's life is worthwhile in the broadest sense. Research shows that some of the most prosperous areas in the UK are those where, regardless of their income, people have the opportunity to lead healthy, fulfilling, and flourishing lives. People in West London are the richest in the UK, but people in the Outer Hebrides have the greatest levels of life satisfaction. If we are to thrive, not just survive, into the 22nd century, the world needs to develop beyond the goal of economic growth and rising GDP towards more productive and fulfilling lives in the broadest sense. As Robert Kennedy said in 1968, GDP measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. It does not allow for the health of our children or the intelligence of our public debate. It measures not our wit, nor our wisdom, nor our learning. I don't know how much wit we have in UCL, but we have plenty of wisdom and learning. So what can we do? The first thing we need to do is to work out what global prosperity would mean if it's not just economic growth. And the second is to work out how we would get there. What is astonishing is how little, relatively speaking, the world has done to address these issues. We might reasonably expect politicians around the world to have articulated a vision of what sustainable prosperity would look like for their citizens and how to get there. However, there's very little evidence of this. The general thrust of policy is to get back to higher growth as soon as possible. But economic and material growth do not equal social progress. And growth and development need to be discussed in qualitative and not just quantitative terms. One of the great necessities of life is a job so what can we say now about the jobs of the future and the quality of life that they will bring with them? Well, in 1930, John Maynard Keynes wrote an essay entitled Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, where he predicted that before 2030, the economy would become so productive that people would only need to work for 15 hours per week. Well, that hasn't happened anywhere. But we might do well to revisit Keynes to start a much needed debate about what should be the role of work in our lives and how does it translate into prosperity for us in any real sense. So, one key factor here is what's happening to young people. One fourth of humanity is now aged between 10 and 24 years old. Every month, one million young Indians turn 18 and start looking for work. But worldwide, two out of five young workers are either not working or working in such ill-paid jobs, according to the International Labour Organization, that they cannot escape want and poverty. So the scale of job creation for the, for the future is huge. And it's not just about creating jobs for all these people, but creating decent jobs. The world of work is also changing. There's a huge rise in self-employment across the globe, the Office for National Statistics in the UK estimates that 16% of the workforce are now self-employed. That's around 4.6 million people. This trend will transform not only our economic, but potentially our political life. Because 5.4 million UK workers are currently employed by the public sector. And soon there will be more people working for themselves than for the state. This could have huge consequences for fiscal sustainability. Once self-employed workers are in the majority, what incentive will they have to support higher taxation for redistributive purposes? The future could be of economies powered by millions of micro-entrepreneurs rather than a small number of giant corporations. The upside of such innovation 
is that as consumers, we are provided with cheaper goods. Uber undercuts, undercuts black cabs, etc. And many platforms are designed to increase our leisure op options. Lux will park your car, Ocado will do your shopping, and Drizzly will develop your alcohol, and Task Rabbit does all the domestic chores. Self-employment provides freedom, choice, and more time to spend with families and others. Another great advantage is that work is not organized by bosses or managers. Look around the room and see if you can see your boss. <coughs> she or he may be an endangered species, replaced by algorithms that connect you via a mobile device. The problem with algorithms is that they don't negotiate, as a series of protests by gig economy workers over the summer showed. So the real question is, with all these new ways of working, do we know how to turn them into prosperity, redefined as everything that makes life worth living? Human creativity has provided for enormous social progress in the past, and it needs to do so and again now. The productivity revolution we need is in social progress and social innovation. Let's use our collective wisdom and sign up for it. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Henrietta, for these important insights. And Lucy, it's now to you to, for your take on the threats we face, the challenges and opportunities. Thank you very us. much and good evening, everybody. So like Kevin, I share a special passion for space science. And I've been working in UCL's Department for Space and Climate Physics for almost 20 years now. And actually, when I joined, I was Thrilled but somewhat surprised to learn that UCL played a major role, or in fact the founding role, of the whole UK space program back in the 1950s under the leadership of Sir Harry Massey. And we follow in his tradition today of acting as a collection of engineers and scientists who want to explore the universe by both sending out probes into the solar system and using telescopes to look remotely to the farthest reaches. And when I was thinking about how space science relates to the challenges of moving into the 22nd century, I couldn't help but reflect on something that was happening this time last week, which was a mission that was launched to an asteroid to grab a sample from the surface of the asteroid and return it to the Earth for analysis. And I also realized that this same asteroid that's going to be studied was in the news for slightly more scary reasons, because in the late 22nd century, there is a slim chance that this asteroid will be an object that impacts into the Earth. Now, I say a slim chance, and I really do mean a slim chance. I don't want anyone to go away this evening thinking that I'm telling you that we're not going to make it into the 23rd century. But as astronomers, we are looking out for these kind of events, and we do so for a serious reason. Impacts have happened in the past, and they have been catastrophic. The death of the dinosaurs is attributed to an impact that happened 65 million years ago. So we search the skies, we monitor what we know is out there, and we look for new objects too. And this brings me to something that was in the news yesterday, and I hope some of you saw that a space mission called Gaia has released its first wave of data. Anybody heard of Gaia? Oh, yes, a few hands. That makes me so happy. Brilliant. UCL is heavily involved in the Gaia mission. And for those of you who haven't heard about it, it's a European Space Agency mission which has an incredibly ambitious task of mapping one billion stars in our own galaxy to uh, create the most accurate and detailed map of our galaxy, telling us where it came from, what state it's in now, and where it will go in the future. And my colleagues in my department are working on this mission. And so actually yesterday, when I realized this was a day of the data release, I rushed down to their offices to ask them, you know, what's the inside scoop? What is it that you found so far? And none of them were there. It turns out they were all out giving press talks and talking to the public about what they found. And they've managed so far to take observations of over a billion stars, but they've just scratched the surface of what they're going to do with this mission, so do keep an eye out for it. So should we find another, mission, another object that comes close to the Earth? Well, Gaia might be the mission that will do that, because as well as mapping these one billion stars, it will find all kinds of other objects in our solar system, including what we call near-Earth objects. And should we find something, then it will be space science, of course, that we will turn to to mitigate the risks and possibly send a mission that will stop an impactor from reaching us. 
So that's the kind of thing that makes it into the news because it's high impact, low likelihood, but high impact kind of event. But actually, space science pervades all of our lives. And every morning when you wake up to get your weather report and you use your mobile phones and you turn onto the internet, you're relying on space science. It's not often covered how intrinsic it is to our lives. And if it is, it reaches less of a fanfare than impacts from space does. But I think that to maintain at least the quality of life we have now, we need to maintain our presence in space. And I would also say that looking to the future, and dealing with the large, significant challenges that we face, space science can provide some answers for us there too. So for example, with climate change. So we know that our Earth's climate is changing, and space science offers us a unique global perspective on how our Earth is changing, from looking at greenhouse gases, glaciers, sea ice, sea level uh, changes, ocean circulations. It's space science that allows us to monitor what's happening to our planet. And there is a whole range of research that's taking place at UCL to do just that. From the Center for Polar Observation Monitoring that's looking at what's happening around the poles of our Earth, to the work looking at forecasting hurricanes, droughts, and floods that we see with changing frequency now that our Earth is evolving. Lots of work happening around working with disaster relief agencies and humanitarian agencies to make sure that we get the information to the people that need it. So from waking up in the morning to long-term planning for future generations, space science is absolutely vitally important. And from my own perspective, I'm interested in something called space weather, which is how the sun's activity can cause issues for our satellites, electricity networks, communications, and so on. And so we do a lot of work at UCL looking around how do we actually make our instrumentation in space resilient to the threats that come from our sun. So... Looking to the future, space science is going to be key. But space science needs a highly trained workforce, and that's another area where UCL plays a significant role. We train engineers, scientists, computer programmers, the whole range of skills that's needed to work in this sector, and we're very proud to do so. We work heavily with industry so that we make sure we also have an economic return for the research that the public invests in. So I think for the future, we need to create the right environment. We need to be thinking globally to make sure that space science can meet the aims of people around the world. And it needs to be absolutely an international effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. And finally, we turn to you, Philippe. Your thoughts? And what My we thoughts. must do to survive My thoughts. into okay. the 22nd My thoughts. century. Well, the question is, how will society survive to the 22nd century? And it could be said that's actually a pretty miserable question. I tend to be more optimistic than that. And for me, it's about prospering and doing well into the 22nd century, although it looks pretty tough right now from certain perspectives. My world is the world of international law, so my society is about rules at the international level and at the global level. And for me, whether you talk about survival or prosperity, it's about understanding what sort of rules of conduct we want under national law and local law and also under international law and global law. And I'm very proud to be part of a law faculty which is really not only number one, I think, in the United Kingdom for international law, but number one in the world uh, for international law, and a law faculty that has just been rated as number one in the UK for impact on these kinds of issues. So it's a very good place to be working on these issues. I also feel incre incredibly proud to be part of a faculty which allows you, uh, Noreena mentioned uh, UCL's way of thinking out of the box and being innovative. Uh, I'm part of a law faculty that allows me to spend seven years working on a single book to devote time to turn that book not only into a written product, but into a film with the BBC and into a stage production with musicians. That's the kind of law faculty that I'm part of, one that thinks differently about how you reach different communities in terms of making an impact. The book that I've just published, which is called East West Street, focuses on a single moment in 1945. It takes the period from 1915 to 1945 and the lives of four men. Many of you in the room will not know that the concepts of genocide and crimes against humanity came into being at that moment 
in the summer of 1945. It's not a long-established set of concepts, nor will most of you be aware that before 1945, a state could do whatever it wanted to its own nationals. If a state wanted to kill half its population, if a state wanted to torture, if a state wanted to disappear, that was all part of what was acceptable because of the principle of sovereignty. And all of that changed in a remarkable moment in 1945 when new rules were put in place on human rights, on trade, on commerce, on the use of force. And that's the area that I uh, and my colleagues at UCL have been focusing on. And what my book essentially explains is that ideas really matter and that individuals can really make a difference to how the world functions. Now, that settlement of 1945, right now, to speak very frankly, is under tremendous challenge. We have a presidential candidate in the United States say that he doesn't believe anymore in international law. And one of his advisors say, we're in Iraq, let's just take the oil. We have a prime minister in this country who wants to remove the United Kingdom from the instrument it created, the European Convention on Human Rights. We have a country that has decided to turn its back on the European Union as though it can suddenly imagine the United Kingdom is no longer part of Europe or part of that world. Taking back control is the mantra of the day. We see it across the world. I see it as a sort of hurtling back to the 1930s, disconnected from historical realities. And it touches all of the areas, trade, refugees, human rights. A lot of people put their hand up in relation to climate uh, and environmental well-being. Without global rules, we're not going to have that kind of well-being at any of those levels. So we can bury our head in the sand and we can hope that the global rules will go away, but we know that because of technological, political, and social changes, that is simply not going to happen. And every single one of my colleagues works in an area which is utterly dependent upon the system of global rules. The challenge for me, for my colleagues at this wonderful law faculty at UCL, is to understand how, in the face of feelings of powerlessness in the local communities, and in the face of the reality of globalization and technological, technological change, we can somehow meld the two into a system of rules that straddles the local, the national, and the regional. I've learned historically that with international law, it's a couple of steps forward, one step back, one step sideways, a couple of steps forward, three steps back. Things go in different directions. But we also know that the acquis of the last 70 years is not simply going to disappear. There may be a calamity, but we will build from what we have achieved. And the function of UCL, with your support at its wonderful law faculty, is to develop the ideas to explain how that is to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe, for your eloquent insights, and thanks to all the panelists for your insights and contributions. Well, if I were to attempt to sum up what we've just learned, what would I say? That with progress clearly comes a host of new challenges. We're more likely to live to a riper age than any previous generation, yet the older we get, the more likely it is that our mental aptitude will fade. We are more connected than at any time in history, and yet we're more insular, more disconnected from our past than at any time in recent years. We are richer than at any time in our recent past, and yet there is a chasm, a gaping chasm, between the economy and social and intergenerational justice. This is, this is some of what I've heard here today, but I've learned something else too, that all these challenges, however onerous they may seem, are within our grasp to resolve and address, as long as we manage to successfully dodge asteroids, that is, Lucy. Um, for if we are, to quote, Kevin, fearless explorers, if we challenge ourselves and others, if we think disruptively while retaining our principles and values, 
then it seems from what you've all said we can deploy all the new knowledge that we have to co-create an innovative future that is safer, fairer, healthier, and more prosperous for, for us all. And I'm very proud that my colleagues here at UCL are working so hard to achieve this goal, working so hard to make a real difference to all of our lives. Now, I have many questions I'd like to ask of our panelists, but I know that there are many of you in the audience with questions of your own. So I'd like to hand over to you now, to the audience, for this, the last part of the event. But as we have only limited time, please, I ask you, do keep your questions brief, and please try and make them questions and not statements. And panelists, for the sake of time, may I ask you to keep your answers relatively short too. So, I think we have people with microphones in the room and people with paddles. So, yes, thank you. So, yes, gentleman in the center. I would like to uh, question the word philanthropy okay. and how we value a human being. For example, in England, um, in 2006, the National Audit said that a million children hadn't been educated at all in the comprehensives. It was £3,000 a year, private schools were £35,000 a year. And this is a global thing worldwide, the 1% with the 99% and the 99% with the 1%. How can we evaluate human beings in a way that everybody understands that a human being is divine and shares in the full divinity of, the, of God in all the religions. And therefore, we need to know far better all the religions and all the traditions and learn from them. OK, well, a big, big philosophical question to start. And Henrietta, I feel that you are sitting there ready, ready to jump to the challenge. So Henrietta, please, may I ask you to to begin? I think that we really do need to invest in our children and to invest in each other. I think that's very clear. We need to understand that one of the great problems of social inequality is that we fail to recognize that other people in other places around the world are actually very like us. And when we fail to recognize that they're very like us, then we can feel that we do not need to take into account their misery or their problems. We can feel that we need to prosecute wars against them. And I think this is the kind of thing that we need to think about. We need to think about the responsibility we have imaginatively as part of a larger humanity. So yes. Lucy. So I wanted to pick up on that point as well because I think this is something that UCL takes very seriously and not only with the student population within the university itself but also in the school that we sponsor, the UCL Academy, which draws from a very diverse population in Camden. It's a non-selective school and the staff there have to deal with students or have to find a way to work with students from a broad, broad range of backgrounds, both socioeconomic and also religious as well. And I think we have lessons actually that we can learn from the school about how you create a very open culture, a safe space to discuss the different experiences the student ha students have and the different backgrounds. And I've certainly learned a lot from working in, in that environment. Thank you, Lucy. Um, do any of our other panelists want to add to this one? If not, I will move to the next question. Uh, yes, I can see a gentleman up there. Thank you. Hi, so let's just say for argument's sake, planet Earth, the condition of planet Earth spirals out of control. Um, when do you think it might be possible to populate Mars, for example? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think this is one for you, perhaps, Lucy, but I will also ask Kevin yeah. to, to definitely weigh in on that. Yeah, so <laughs> going to Mars, to me, always seems to be 20 to 30 years away. You know, I've been hearing it for a long time now, but... The technology to get there is seriously being worked on, and NASA does have a plan to get 
to Mars. It's a pretty harebrained plan to me because it involves capturing an asteroid and bringing it back to Earth to work out how we can work on different environments. Going back to the moon, okay, that's much more plausible. We've done that before. But then going to Mars in the 2030s, which is incredibly close, and you think about all the challenges we have to overcome to get there. Living on another planet, different atmosphere, different temperatures, food source, water, fuel that you need, and so on. But the technology is being worked on, and perhaps the most tangible thing at the moment is, is the rocket launching technology that we need to be able to get that distance in the solar system. So maybe I'll just give NASA's timeline and say the 2030s. Well, Kevin, as a man who has spent considerable time at NASA, um, what, what, what are your thoughts? So, so NASA say that Mars is 20 years in the future, and it has been since about the 1960s. And uh, um, so, at one, it's, that idea that you would go to Mars and terraform it and colonise it is one that's actually talked about quite seriously. At species level, it seems slightly reprehensible to go around vandalising one planet after another <laughs> until you run out of them. Um, uh, 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 but, but underlying, and I think possibly the subtext of the question is, you know, what's the point of doing that when we're hearing about some of the awful things that are going on? And, and I understand that at a superficial uh, level. But here's the thing about exploration and discovery. We might have had this conversation 100 years ago about Antarctica and, and talked about it in the same way, sort of slightly jovial about the point of Antarctica. And when Scott and Amundsen went there, no one knew what the point of it w was. It was made of rock and ice, and no one knew of anything that could be done down there except for dying rather heroically. Um, by the end of that same century, of course, the, the paleo atmospheres we were pulling out of the ice cores were the most convincing evidence yet that we had that the climate was changing in a way that might threaten all life on the planet. And so that unknown knowledge from the start of the century was literally saving the planet, or hopes to help to save the planet by the end of it. And so I think it's worth going there. Um, I think we should try not to move there. <laughs> and, um, and Philippe, and Philippe if, if, we, if we do move there, if we, if we have a community, a, if it is colonised, what, what new implications actually, does I've, I've this have for international terrible, law? Terrible news for Kevin, because I think we're not actually allowed to move there. I think there is a treaty which says you're not allowed to colonise and you're not allowed to live. So all these wonderful scientists who are breaking international law in all of their... But, but Kevin mentioned the Antarctic. It's, it, I mean, the Antarctic is an area that shows the possibility of hope. In, in 1959, a treaty was adopted which said no one can appropriate the Antarctic. It is common heritage of mankind. It is to be used only for research. And that treaty has actually withstood the test of time. It is now uh, more, you know, approaching 60 years old, and it has allowed research to be done. So it's one of those areas, rather like the ozone layer, that we look to as a moment of success to show that where there is political will, actually states and people can come together and make a difference. Thank you. Uh, yes, I can. Yes, thank you. Over there, lady over there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, nobody has talked about war and peace so far. And it seems to me that, uh, worryingly, here we are in this century with so much more prosperity, um, that we can still say to ourselves that this is quite a frightening time. And I think I go back to Professor Sands, you know, the 1940s, this big sort of emphasis on building a peaceful future. And that's why the United Nations came into being and so on, and why indeed the EU event, you know, its early, early part of, of the European community was to make sure we were at peace. And yet here we are with many ghastly wars going on around the world with, it seems to me, no sign of any real mitigation of some of the underlying fundamental uh, discrepancies between people's beliefs and how they're going to pull themselves together. So it seems to me it's a very important part of how we're going to survive, is can we make peace again? Thank you. Uh, Philippe, do you want so, to so start? The, the answer is, I mean, it's, you're, you may be surprised. I'm really glad you've raised that question. There's far less international war today than there was 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. 
Um, there are now internal conflicts, and there are several very, very serious internal conflicts. But my generation is the first to live on the territory of this land where there's been no wars for our entire lives with our neighbors. I mean, that is a remarkable achievement. If you take the history of Europe, whether it's 200 years or 400 years or 600 years, it's an extraordinary thing. And we need to ask ourselves, how has that happened? I, I think that it's not disconnected with the settlement that came internationally and in <coughs> Europe after the Second World War, which created, if you like, a degree of economic interdependence, firstly through coal and steel, which would make it impossible for countries to arm. That was the theory originally of the EU. It's obviously warts and all mushroomed into all sorts of other things. But I think that's why so many people, uh, including myself, I've been away from the UK for two months. I've come back this morning, actually. I've flown back from the States this morning. And I've flown back with a really heavy heart coming into the United Kingdom, asking myself the question, is this my country anymore? What has happened? And I ask that in the context also linking to the other issue, uh, which everyone is, I think, has in mind of refugees and the question about children. You know, there are about two and a half thousand unaccompanied children in the Calais camp right now, Ch children of between 10 and 16, which this country will not let in. They're, they have no one with them, they're on their own. They come from war zones elsewhere, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan. Which is the country that has used bombs in all three of those territories and takes basically no one, the United Kingdom? Which country has used no bombs in any of those three territories and takes a million and a half refugees? Germany. And I think that poses a very fundamental question which we all have to ask ourselves, what have we become in this country? And where are we going? And the law and these other sciences have a lot to say about that. But I'm very grateful to you for asking that question. Henry. <laughs> Henrietta, did you want to? Well, um, yes, just to, again, say thank you and say that, of course, conflict is one of the greatest threats to global prosperity. Um, and it's not always conflict over values, although very often that's laid on top of conflicts that are about conflicts over resources, particularly water. I mean, we are living now on a very, very water short planet. And to give you an idea of how bad it's actually got, some of you may or may not know that London is the 14th most water short city in the world, and it rains all the time. So just imagine what everybody else's water problem is like. Thank you. Um, Yes, there is a question all the way over. Ah, oh. yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's, it seems a shame that the scale of uh, our ambition uh, and our ability to implement uh, what, what we uh, desire, uh, especially UCL, is uh, based on philanthropy and uh, possibly the philanthropy of the 1%. Um, so, given that we may be stuck with capitalism, what faith do you have that we are capable of defining new forms of capitalism that can help us on our way towards prosperity and achieving our ambitions? Um, well, if I may, I'll break this question into two parts. And the first part is really, perhaps I'll ask um, you, John, to comment on it, is really um, this challenge, this challenge that you as a group have of needing funding and needing resources in a very finite, resource finite environment to be able to do these incredible things that you hope to do. And then maybe we'll move on to the kind of wider question. Sure, well I have to say that of course, I mean I don't wanna, I mean I'm, a, I'm what one might say to the left of center, so let me start by <laughs> saying, let me, st let me start by saying that. But l let me also say, you know, in medical research, I think the Gates Foundation, for example, is a very good example of, 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 of capitalists funding research. And I've certainly had capitalists red in tooth and claw fund some of our research. So there is a, a degree uh, to which we shouldn't paint capitalism in as a, 
as uh, too evil. I mean, even as a socialist, I, I uh, would say that. So I think that, uh, that, uh, I think that um, what, uh, an implicit point that has been made several times in several questions is the need for empathy. And I think that uh, that's come up implicitly in, in other people's questions too. And I think that even capitalists can have empathy. Uh, <laughs> And, we, you know, that's what we should be playing towards, for sure. And, and it's, it's for, cer for certain there. For certain, it's there. So I think that one of the things we need to be aware of is empathy, both in a religious sense between religions and between the rich and the poor and between nations. I agree that we, you know, when we start to have wars, they are always the other. Uh, and uh, this is a way that wars are started by treating the, the people who are on the other side as just the other and, and less than human. So I think that empathy is something we need to be working on more generally, both for philanthropy and politically more generally. And, and both... And Kevin, both you and Lucy also talked about the fact that it's important, especially in your areas, to also be thinking about collaboration with industry. Um, that this is that there is a kind of that there isn't it's not necessarily a zero sum game, and that there are opportunities to innovate together. Um, do you want to speak on that? Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, I think I think it's important to have, if you'll forgive the pun, sort of a mixed economy of the ways that we fund. The, the efforts at progress that we have because uh, governments can only go so far uh, and they have, they have a duty to the taxpayer and so they limit the sorts of things that you can fund and they limit the, the sorts of risks that you might take. And, and so ph philanthropic uh, uh, donations actually in many ways can be more flexible and allow you to take on some of those high risk but potentially enormous return projects that, that, that were the stuff actually of, of the Academy of Old. Uh, and so I think that they will play an important part, should play an important part in the future of progress for us. I do think it's become increasingly difficult to make progress because we've painted ourselves into narrower and narrower corners. And at a time when we've gained so much by going deeper and deeper into narrower and narrower defined holes, we've got almost as much to be gained by going across. And those, that, 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 that source of funding tends to have to be more flexible and that tends to be philanthropic. Lucy? Yeah, I think... These are really good points, and to perhaps follow on from both speakers, engagement is, I think, the key way to, to lead to empathy. And so, as an academic community, we have to be out talking to a wide range of people who fund and benefit from the research that we do. But then, in terms of this broad range of funding sources that we rely on, have open to us now, I think that's a way of perhaps democratizing a bit more in a bit more fine scale what research the public of different forms want to see happening. And so I certainly see that playing out in space science at the moment where we have, as one example, a mission to the moon that's being um, crowdsourced for funding. Mm -hmm. And you know, I never thought I would see this, but people want to see these things happen. If people want to see it happen, then it is possible to say, well, actually, as well as paying via the taxes, we could actually put some direct funding into the things that we find really exciting and where we want to see the progress made. And so that variety, I think, gives power to the people who are supporting these missions. And um, Billy, yeah, does... No, I, I, it's, just, it's, re it's a really interesting question. I've just been thinking through the own research that I've been doing in the last few years that the guy who invented the concept of genocide was a man called Raphael Lemkin. And he put it into a book that he published in 1944 called Axis Rule. Uh, and chapter nine of that book was the word that he invented, genocide taken from the Latin and the Greek, um, genus and sede. And if you look, as I've done, at the root that caused him to invent that word, the funding comes from three sources. Corporations. He worked with unknown, I've not been able to find them, a Swedish company that had offices all over occupied Europe that funded him to gather the Nazi decrees across occupied Europe, governments, and the Carnegie Foundation. And I think that actually, when we go back to our own research, we'll see that historically there's nothing new here. It's always an interplay 
of the private, the corporate, the governmental, the philanthropic foundations. And there are variations on the theme, but you know, John's, the work that John is describing, I'm sure, and the world that you're describing, John, it's the same world. It's an interplay of different sources of support. And I think we like to, we should avoid sort of pigeonholing good sources of funding and not so good sources of funding. Actually, life is more complicated than that, and there are a lot of different sources, and um, it's the interplay between those different forms that I think is very important. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, I can see there. <laughs> Thank you. The conversation about the care of children, the ongoing investment in their development, and the need for this empathy and morals. At what point, and as tonight's campaign is called, it's all academic, at which point do you think social and emotional intelligence will draw level with our academic output. Um, which of our panellists wants to comment? Uh, um, we didn't hear all of the question, but was it, um, it was about social and emotional intelligence. Of at, a, at which point that will draw level with our ac academic output? At which point that will? Draw level, as in okay. come to be recognised. Okay, so at the moment, so the questioner is saying at the moment, you know, the emphasis has been on traditional intelligence. And yet when we're thinking about the future and the skills that are needed in the future, should we be recognizing the importance of social and emotional intelligence and will we be recognizing okay. them? I mean, I, th I, th I think I'm not a clinician, uh, but I play one on TV, as they say. <laughs> I'm not a clinician, but you know, the clinician, I mean, I would say that the, the clinicians in the audience, and I'm guessing there's three or 400 of them, they will have to have emotional intelligence. The clinical exam is about emotional intelligence. You don't want to walk in and just be told, well, you've got this disease, now clear off, sort of thing. It's really about, it comes back to empathy. I think it is, it is absolutely valued, and it has to be valued. It has to be valued. I, would, I don't think it is not valued now. I think it has to be valued. And Henrietta, you're doing a lot of work on what do we value. Mm. You know, is this something that we should be, that is part of what you're working on or should be part of what you're working on? Well, yes it is, and I've been working for some years on something which I call the ethical imagination, which is how we imagine other people to be like us or don't. And one of the things that struck me very much is that when a lot of young people were going to Terrier Square and to various other kinds of great uprisings against their, their governments, one of the things they wanted to do in those squares was to get married. A large number of people wanted to start their emotional life and their married life in the context of that great political moment of change because there's a resonance between starting on one journey and starting on another and the commitment to that process of self-growth and self-change that comes through that. So I think in all, in all areas of life, I mean, I think politics, for example, is an area of life which we've come to think of in a rather reductive sort of way. as a set of instrumental processes which are about shuffling counters. I think actually a real life of politics is precisely about that kind of, of engagement, about the investment in the, in, the, in the life of others, in those who are not yet even here. Thank you. Um, yes, I can see. Do you have one? Yes. Okay. Uh, evening panel. My name's Intisar Shah. Um, thinking about survival into the 22nd century, uh, I'm really glad the, the lady earlier raised the question about war and peace. But assuming that we manage to avoid nuclear war and shortages of water and food security and everything else. Um, can the panel comment on the age-old problem of governance? Um, since history started, I don't think we've found a model that works. Um, you know, the, the problems that we see in Syria, they all started because the population wasn't happy with their government and the government reacted ostensibly. Um, perhaps the Scandinavian model is going part way uh, you know, to the ultimate goal, but can, can, can the panel comment on the problem of governance? I mean, that seems to me like the key, key issue. Thank you. Um, maybe, Philippe, you'll start. 
Gosh, what, on, on, that big, on that big topic? What a huge question. Actually, I think it's connected to what John said earlier and, and what Henrietta said earlier. It's about, for me, it's about how you treat people. And do you treat people as individuals or do you treat them as members of a group? And governance problems tend to erupt when them and us concepts become very marked. So the city I've spent much of the last seven years in used to be called Lemberg, then became Lvov, now is Lviv. In the late 19th and early 20th century, it was a thriving multicultural metropolis with a fantastic university, fantastic cultural life, fantastic science going on. It's now lost that multiculturalism and it is essentially a harmonious but pretty dull place. Not well governed, plenty of corruption so that it doesn't sort the thing out. But I think at the heart of the issue it is a question of senses of identity. And I think one of the things that's happening right now is identity politics are going up and up and up and up. And that is tending to pit one part of a community or one part of a society against another part of a society. And it's an inadequate answer to a really important question that you've raised. But the challenge, and this is a challenge not just for philosophers and scientists, but also for lawyers, how do you help design mechanisms that allow communities, whether they be divided by ethnicity, religion, race, political ideology, whatever it is, live in harmony? And that is a fundamental question that we seem to be still very far from sorting out. Thank you. Um, yes, there's a question over there, and then I, and then I will come back. Thank so you. as med medical technology advances, uh, my belief is that the ethical considerations haven't really kept up. But, so my question to the panel is, would any of you... Uh, have a brain transplant if you, if you knew you were going to die. Would any of you have a... I mean, I, I think, you know, in the future we're going to be generating organs, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I suspect we'll probably be able to uh, grow a, a new brain or even uh, take a brain out of uh, uh, somebody else. Okay. Um, well, I think there's one person who I'm coming to first on this one. Will we... Uh, how far away are we from this, from this point? Will we be having brain transplants? I mean, I can see a small step in that direction, for example, with, with grafts of neurons. I can see that coming for, for sure. Uh, well, I mean, it's here. That's here. That's here in a very limited sense in, uh, in, in Parkinson's disease. More generally, I'm, I mean, I, I'm really of the view that we, we should expect to die uh, actually, we, sh we, need to, we, ne we need to we need to let go of the idea that we should live forever, and w we need to come to terms with our mortality. I, I, so, for myself, no, absolutely no, no, absolutely no. I think we need to know we're mortal. Kevin, you wanted to so, so, uh, actually, weigh in here. Um, so they, they have done effectively brain transplants in the early days when they were experimenting with cardiac surgery, when they were trying to show that you could support the brain's circulation with an external circulation. There were some pretty ghoulish Russian, uh, init initially Russian experiments where they transplanted the head of a dog into the oh, circulation yeah. of another dog. So that is effectively a brain transplant. So, so it has been done, and it also highlights the fact that in the early days, there was some a reasonably dark time around about the 20th century where the pace of progress was much faster than our pace of ability to understand the ethical con constru uh, constructs that surrounded it. And that led to, an, I, I mean, the, the early days of cardiothoracic surgery are pretty grim, but, you know, the Tuskegee syphilis trials. So, so we were, we've, we've definitely improved and we've definitely put frameworks around, but we always struggle to keep up. You know, there is no sense of, oh, we've made this much scientific and medical advance, so we've got to make this much moral and ethical advance. We're, it's always a fight. And that's why I bring us back to that idea that the whole of this thing is an exploration. And, and like all explorers, you hope for good fortune, but you just you end up causing solutions that are in themselves problems, and you mitigate those, those problems 
and you create more problems and more solutions. That's just how it goes, and that's true of the ethics and morals that go around it, as it is of the technology that surrounds You've it. You've got to tell us what happened to the dogs. <laughs> Everyone wants to know. Th they, they did quite badly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good evening. My name is Naki Rizvi. I'd like to thank all the panelists. And first of all, I think that there's been so much research and so much work that's been done to look at some of the issues that our society faces for hundreds of years. But I think, unfortunately, this world has had more problems because it's always been that money has trumped morals. And I do think that we do have the solutions for many of the problems, but the world continues to be plagued by them because we are not able to address this issue. And I guess the second aspect of this would be if there's one thing that my degree in systems engineering has taught me is that oftentimes we do tend to look at things in a very linear manner and forget about circular thinking. And I guess until and unless we have interdisciplinary teams that can look at issues in a circular manner, I don't think we'll be able to address some of the problems that our society faces. And I'd like to hear what our panelists have to say about that. Thank you. Henrietta. Well, I, I think that one of the great strengths of UCL is its ability to build interdisciplinary teams that understand that they're working on a problem that's a collaborative problem. Um, and that's one of the reasons why UCL set up the Institute for Global Prosperity. In fact, that was one of the very first briefs I, I got when I started, which is build interdisciplinary teams from across a complete university to challenge the big problems of the day and do it in an innovative way. So I think that we, I think that we can do this, but the, the one thing that I would say in my long experience of doing it is the key thing that you have to begin with is to make sure that all of those teams from all the disciplines they come from are actually know that they're working on the same problem. Because trust me, when you get a load of people together in the room, they all think they are working on the same problem, <laughs> but actually they're not. Okay? But as long as you can get them all working on the same problem, you have a huge potential there. And you, this, is the, this is the whole purpose of the UCL Grand Challenges. It's the whole purpose of the disruptive thinking. It's in, actually in the DNA of, of UCL. And one of the things that supporting the campaign will do is actually to allow that kind of work to go ahead. And I think that's a really, really important for getting to the 22nd century. Thank you. And now, um I know that there's somebody here who's been waving at me for a very long time, so please, can I have a microphone to this lady? I worry, so it may be a false premise, but are there going to be so many more of us on the planet, too many more of us on the planet by the time we get to the 22nd century, uh, that actually there will be an awful lot of mitigation that will have to be done moral, ethical, practical, physical. Uh, I'd like your views on that. And I suppose maybe you want to review whether or not you want to get to Mars or not. But um, I'd be interested in your views on population explosion and what that means for the 22nd century. Thank you. Um, and just, panelists, this is actually the final question we're going to be taking from the audience. Sorry, audience. So, um, so maybe you all will comment. We will all comment on that. Um, Kevin. So, I mean, this is the classic example, isn't it, of something that looked like a great idea at the time, which was increasing life expectancy uh, and infant survival, and that turns out to be quite a big problem later on. <laughs> and, 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 of course, uh, of course, you don't do a thing because you foresee a, a difficulty with it later, and it is, in some respects, a happy problem. Uh, you know, what we did to infant mortality and life expectancy generally in the 20th century is to be applauded and is a product of science and technology and the engineering and the social change of, of that century. Um, uh, uh, yes, it, it absolutely is an example of the problems it creates and, and some of the big problems we've seen, uh, you know, you could argue uh, certainly with the uh, uh, SARS outbreak, say, of 2003, uh, these things are at least in part, if not directly, a consequence of overcrowding and overpopulation. Uh, and so we will absolutely need mitigation. But this is, I guess, what I'm talking about. This is part of the role of all of us, of every discipline that we have in a university like this, is to go forwards and to see that coming and to stop it, or once it's happened, to limit it as best it can. 
Lucy? So I think, I mean, when we think about that question, we think about it in the context of the world as we know it. But for me, one of the biggest developments that we can achieve to have a huge step change is in our generation of energy. So, for example, once we have fusion energy sources, which are being worked on, again, it's sometime in the future, that will allow us to address the issue of water shortage that we've already heard about. Desalination plants could become something that's much more feasible, and then if you can address that, then parts of the world which are currently arid and uninhabitable could be lived in. So I think that these very ambitious aims we have for humanity could ultimately mean that we might ask this question now, but in 50 to 100 years, the world will be a very different place. I slightly disagree. I slightly disagree. I think that this is enabling behavior, actually, that we are, and that we have to fundamentally uh, deal with population growth. We have to do that, and that means taking religion on, taking religion on head, head on. I mean, religion, I think religion has two functions, and that is to channel male violence and to control female sexuality. And that those... <laughs> <laughs> and unless we, unless we grasp that nettle, uh, unless we grasp that nettle eventually, then it's can, not going to end well, however many deserts we green. <laughs> Henrietta, do you want to follow on from that? <laughs> ah, yes, of course. Yes, 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 yes. Well, I'm not going to rise to that particular bit. But, uh, <laughs> but I enjoyed it enormously. <laughs> um, I think what's happening with population, population is, is growing on the planet, but I think the first thing we need to understand is, is the unevenness of that. And what, what that means is that we need to deal with issues about population by some serious reflection on issues of social justice. So for example, at the moment in the UK, we are not reproducing ourselves. So the UK population is not growing, uh, growing in that sense, it, taken as a whole. In Japan, the population is definitely aging and not growing. In fact, across Europe, there are distinct signs that various other countries, the population is aging and the, and the characteristics of that population are changing. By 2050, uh, more, in some African countries, more than 60% of the population will be the, under the age of 25. So this is, a different, this is a different world. And it becomes an intergenerational issue, as we've heard discussed in, you know, many times and in the press, but it also an issue about movement across the planet because of the way in which some, some, some parts of the world have many more resources than others and will continue to have many more resources targeted on fewer people. So I think there are a whole series of issues that are connected to population which are not just about the absolute amount. And Philippe? Well, I mean, what can a lawyer add to that question? We know nothing about anything. We just sort of felch off the views of others, but uh, what we do see, <laughs> what we do see is we do see what population, uh, well, uh, the first point I would make is that I agree entirely with Henrietta, it's, it's about the inequalities that are going to be caused, and what I see with my work is the inequalities around the world which are just staggering and appalling, and that is going to lead, it's going to lead to something. But in practical terms, it's not the population as such increasing that causes the problem. It's the demand for resources. And so what you see, as I think Henrietta and others have made points about, is that when demand for fresh water increases beyond what is sustainable, the resource disappears and conflict erupts. And you see that in terms of agricultural resources and other resources. So the question is partly one of energy, but partly do we have the wherewithal to find alternative means of producing for ourselves the basic resources that we need to sustain human life? The law can contribute to that, but it comes back to the point that's made before. It's only in an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary way that you can really address these issues. We can design rules as lawyers, but we need help from historians, from geologists, from natural scientists, from economists, and from others, and I think maybe that's the point to end. For me, you need a community that works together, bringing together a range of different backgrounds, and if you don't have that, you can't address these problems. 
Thank you. Um, well, we covered a lot, didn't we, in this discussion? War, peace, money, morals, brain transplants, <laughs> syphilis, asteroids, rockets, collaboration, disruption, empathy, and community. I want to thank all our panelists for you know, doing a fantastic job. And please, can you now retake your seats? to our provost to end. We want to go through those three questions that you were asked at the beginning, the three biggest issues, challenges that we will face over the coming century. If you think it's sustainability, please raise your panels. Paddles. Paddles. Okay. Human rights and equality. Oh. See more of this. And aging. Do you know what? We started a more diverse group. We end with more consensus. And now let me hand over to Malcolm, to Michael, to close. Brilliant. Well done. Thank you. So um, that was an amazing uh, debate. And uh, Lucy, Henrietta, John, Kevin, Philippe, um, that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I knew that you would give um, superb talks, um, and I wasn't wrong in that at all. But I think your um, brilliance, your it intelligence, your emotional and your social intelligence was really uh, on display as you answered the questions. I thought, I thought that, that the answers were just uh, absolutely superb, and I sat there thinking, thank goodness it's not me having to answer them. <laughs> Uh, so uh, a huge thank you to you uh, for, uh, for giving the campaign a, a good launch this evening. And of course to Narina, uh, brilliantly chaired. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving up uh, your time and coming to chair that. Uh, also brilliantly done. Uh, and we're very lucky uh, that, that you're part of the UCL uh, family. Uh, now, um, to coin a phrase, I'm going to bring us slightly back down to planet Earth. Um, and remind you that this is a campaign launch. And so as we launch a campaign, uh, we will um, think about uh, the sort of target that we're uh, aiming for. And uh, rather than just sort of get straight to it, uh, I thought a little bit of build-up will be good. Uh, we do have a new phrase that we can use. Even cap capitalists can have empathy. Uh, I think has become a new campaign slogan, uh, John. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for that. Some of the other things you said, maybe we'll leave off the campaign uh, uh, slogan, but, uh, uh, but uh, thank you for that um, thought. Um, so uh, the amount of money that we are going to raise, I want to remind you that we've already, in this target, raised £253 uh, million pounds of it, which has already been put to extraordinarily uh, good uses along the lines of the debate that we've uh, just um, heard. Um, it will be one of the largest campaigns in the whole of Europe. There are two universities that I find very difficult to mention when I'm standing on a, uh, on a platform. Uh, they're both ancient and one of them is in the Fens. <laughs> um, uh, and they have uh, significant campaigns, but it's absolutely uh, our intention to give them uh, a good run uh, for their money. So, I am about to, with the aid of some animation, reveal the target. So, the target is... So thank you. That used to be uh, $1 billion. At today's exchange rate, it's 792. 
uh, thousand, uh, uh, million. So, um, so uh, that's it. That's where we're going. Um, we have enjoyed your support tonight. Please do stay very much in touch with us with the campaign. And I'd now like to uh, invite you to join us uh, in a reception. It's uh, a reception with a lot of activities in it. Um, and and the, th the idea really is to introduce you to more aspects of the campaign. Uh, so there are lots of people waiting to entertain you um, and there are some refreshments too. So it's through uh, these doors and through into um, the back hall uh, on this level. So please come and join us. I look forward to seeing more of you there. Thank you very much indeed.